thank you, choir. That was fabulous. Take your Bibles, find Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And John chapter 9. I um, started talking to you last week um, about telling your story. I, um, our story about Christ and what Christ has done in our life um, is very, very powerful, maybe more powerful than you realized. And so I wanted to talk to you a little more about that today. And I'm going to do that from Luke chapter 8 and John chapter 9. Um, there, was a, there was a man who lived in a small town and um, he had um, absolutely no friends. Um, no, one, no one liked him at all and understandably so. Um, the man was the terror of the town um, and he was the terror of the town because he was tormented. Um, he was tormented by evil spirits. And so everyone was afraid of him, and, and they would do everything possible um, to try to contain him and control him and um, protect themselves from him. They, they would put him in chains. They would tie him up. Um, any, anything that they possibly could do um, to, to bind this man. He was um, despised, um, hated, detested, um, feared by absolutely everyone. And, and you again, you, you really couldn't blame them um, because he was so tormented, he was filled with, with this demon possession and, and just very fearful to even be around him. And, and these chains and ropes that they would bind him with, they, they could not hold him. They could not control him. He had this unbelievable strength. And, and so evidently this has been going on for a very, very long time. And um, so all he did was kind of roam around the city. Um, he'd go from place to place. Often you would see him in the cemetery and he might be in there just, just sitting there crying or maybe in there just cutting himself with stones. Um, he, he was in a, a very hopeless, helpless situation. And then he met Jesus. And when he met Jesus, Jesus healed him and, and rescued him from his misery. And, and as a matter of fact, we, we looked at the story of this man, I want to say it was about a year ago, um, eight, nine, ten months ago, something like that. And so I'm not going to go into great detail about the story um, with you once again today, but I did want to show you something um, that Jesus said to him. And so it is in Luke chapter 8, and I'll start reading in verse 37. It's Luke chapter 8. And I'll read in verse 37 where it says, Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadareans, so it's talking about um, everyone in town, everyone in this little region, they asked him, asked Jesus to depart from them, for they were seed. And that word seized in the Greek, um, it, it means frozen, or it, it often would be translated to the word extreme or great. So, so these folks were frozen with fear. They, they feared Jesus greatly. So, so they were so afraid they asked Jesus to leave, to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And he got into the boat and returned. If you don't want Jesus around, he's probably not going to be around. 
He's not going to force his way onto you. This is, this is what saddens me about America. It, it is like we are asking him to leave. And he may just oblige us on that. It, 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 it's just so sad. Here's Jesus. He, he had come into this little region of the Gadareans and, and he was helping a man. He, he healed this man from his, his demon possession. He rescued him from, from, I mean, just complete helplessness. And, and the people in the city, they hear about what Jesus has done, and now they're afraid of Jesus, and they ask him to leave. At first, at first they lived their life in fear of this man. No one wanted to be anywhere near him. They, they greatly feared this man. Jesus comes into town, Jesus heals the man, and now they're no longer afraid of the man, they're afraid of Jesus. And so they ask him to leave. Verse 38, Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him, begged Jesus, that he might be with him. So, so here's a man who's been tormented by demons his entire life basically, Jesus has come along. Jesus has healed him. Jesus has made him better. Jesus has given him hope. Jesus has given him life. Now, now, up until this man met Jesus, this man was alive. His heart was beating. Um, he could breathe. He could walk. He could eat. He, he was alive. But now, Jesus has come, in, come along and he has given him life. He gave him life in Jesus. He has real life now. And, and this real life in this man, it's a new life. It has created this excitement for Jesus. And now he wants to spend time with Jesus. He doesn't want to go back into this town who... who really cared nothing about him. He had no friends, no place to go where he had any good relationships. No one cared about him, so he just wants to go with Jesus. Sounds good, right? Sounds really good. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him, begged Jesus, that he might be with him, but... Jesus sent him away saved. So, so this guy, he basically says to Jesus, can I come with you? Can, can I go wherever you go? Can I follow you? Can I spend time with you? And I mean, just wants to spend his time with Jesus. And Jesus says no, and he sends him away. Now why in the world would Jesus do that? Why, why would he send him away? Well, verse 39 explains it to us. He tells him, return to your own home. Jesus says, you go back. You go back to your town. You go back to your family. You go back to your own people. You go back to your own town. Because, now I want you to understand, God doesn't call everyone to go overseas to share the gospel. God doesn't call everyone to stand in a pulpit like I'm doing this morning to preach the gospel. Sometimes God just wants you to go home and tell them about Jesus. Sometimes God just wants you to tell these people here at church who are in your Sunday school class about Jesus. Sometimes God wants us to go home. Return to your own home your own house, and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus has done for him. So God rescues this man, and now the man wants to be with Jesus, but Jesus tells him, no, what I want you to do is go home to your family, go to your town, and tell them what God has done for you. Amen. You go tell them what Jesus has done for you. 
And, and, and listen, the point of this scripture is there are those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have a story to tell. And we're supposed to go and tell that story. Whether it's to go to your house, go to your friends, go to your work, go to your church, go wherever, your town, and tell your story about Jesus. Jesus wants all of us to tell our story of what He's done in our life. And I want you to understand your story is important. It's very important. It is unique because it's what Jesus has done in your life. You are an expert at what Jesus has done for you. Your, your story is unique because it's what Jesus has done in your life. No one knows your story. No one can tell your story quite the way you can tell your story because you experienced it. It's your story. Sharing your story is how you will tell others about Jesus. And understand, I want you to understand, you don't have to know the Bible from cover to cover to share your story. That's right. All you have to know is what Jesus has done for you. That's all you need to know is this is what Jesus did for me. Let me explain just in a little more detail. This time it's John chapter 9. John chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples... Um, they, they've been through a little bit of tough time. Jesus has had to escape some people that don't care for him or trying to kill him. And, and so Jesus and his, his guys, they are out walking down the road, and they come across this man. They, they actually see a man who can't see anything. This man was blind. And we find out, we discover that he had been blind from birth. And so, so they come across this man who's never seen anything in his entire life. I mean, absolutely nothing. And so the disciples ask Jesus a question, and, and we look at it as somewhat of a strange question, but at least back in their day, it would have been a normal question, but they look at Jesus and they say, well, this man's blind, so who sinned? Did, did he sin, or was it his parents who sinned? With which one sinned that caused his blindness? And, and Jesus began to explain to them, well, his blindness is not because of his sin. His blindness is not because his parents sinned. His blindness is so that you guys can see. His blindness is so that you guys can see the work that God is about to do. His blindness has absolutely nothing to do with anyone's sin. His blindness has to do with you're about to see the mighty work of God. And then, then you probably know the story Jesus spits on the ground. He makes some mud. He puts this mud on this man's eyes. And then Jesus tells him, go down to the pool and wash off the mud. And so the guy did, and, and then the guy's able to see. I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing what just happened to this guy. And, 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 and here's something that we should always remember. Sometimes the things that we are going through in life, it, it, it's not to punish us. It, it, it's not even that we go through tough times and, 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 and illnesses and suffering and, and difficult days. It, it's not always just for us. Sometimes our illness, sometimes our difficulties, sometimes our suffering is for someone else. 
Sometimes it's so that they can see what God is doing in us. Sometimes what we go through is so that we'll have a story to tell about the mighty work of God in our life. So here's a man, he's never seen anything in his entire life, and, and he has this encounter with Jesus, and I love it. Jesus makes mud, smears his mud on this guy's face, and then the miracle of God. And so now the man has a story to tell. But his story takes somewhat of a strange turn. This man's neighbors, who have, have known him all his life, they, they begin to question and go, well, is this the same guy? Mm -hmm. Is this the guy we grew up with? Is this the guy that we see begging every single day? Could it possibly be him? And, and evidently, evidently, this blind man is, of course, unable to take care of himself. Back in his day, it wouldn't have been near as easy as it is today to get a job if you were blind. Evidently, he is unable to take care of himself. His parents are unable to take care of him. So the only way he could possibly survive is just to beg. And so the, the, his neighbors look at him. Well, is this the guy? Is this the blind beggar that we've known all our life? And the man says, well, yeah, it's me. I'm the man. And that's kind of where we'll pick up the story this morning. Because again, he has a great story to tell. And so it's John chapter 9 and verse 8. And here's what it says. Therefore, therefore is therefore because Jesus made mud and he put it on this guy's eyes. And he tells the guy to go down to the pool, wash the mud off, and the guy does, and then he can see. So, therefore, the neighbors and those who had previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Verse 9, Some said, That is he. Yeah, yeah. I recognize him. That's the guy. Others said he is like him. So some looked at him and said, well, yeah, that's the guy. He, he's the guy that we've known all our life that, that's been begging. and um, he, He's the guy we always see out here begging. You know, he's the blind guy. And then others said, well, I don't know. I mean, he, he kind of looks like him. But I'm not sure if it's him because the guy that used to sit out here begging, he was blind. This guy's not blind, so I'm not sure if it's him. Kind of looks like him, but I'm not positive it's him. So some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. And so he said, I'm he. I am he. And, th and so this formerly blind man, he says, hey, everybody. Can't you see? It's me. It's me. Are y'all blind? It's me. Verse 10. Therefore they said to him, How are your eyes opened? They asked him, How in the world can you possibly see? I mean, how, how is something like that even possible? So now, now, he can tell his story. Because he's been blind from birth, and now he can see. He has a story to tell, because Jesus has done something in his life. We have a story to tell, because Jesus has done something in our life. Verse 11, he answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay, and anointed my eyes. That word anointed there is not the normal word that we think of when we use the word anointed. Often when we use that word, we're talking about some kind of religious ceremony, usually with some kind of oil and, and, and just a very, very special ceremony. 
But, but when they use the word anointing here, it, it's a word that simply means to smear. I mean, it, it is simply talking about the Greek word, which would normally be translated to the word smear. It's talking about Jesus making mud and smearing it into this guy's eyes. So the man answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Amen. He's telling his story. It's as simple as, this is what happened to me. Verse 12, then they said to him, where is he? Where, where is this Jesus who you said gave you your sight? Where is he? And he said, I do not know. Verse 13, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. So, so these folks go, you say Jesus made you see? And how did he make you see? He smeared mud on your eyes, and now you can see, well, just where is this Jesus? And he goes, I don't know where he is. All I know is I can see I'm able to see. And they decide, well, that's not good enough. We need some answers about this. So they take him to the Pharisees. Now, why did they take him to the Pharisees? Because the Pharisees are experts. They're experts in religion. They're experts in the law. So we'll just take him to the experts. They can examine him. They can question him. They can see what's going on. They can discover what really happened here. Because if what this man is telling us is correct, then if this Jesus guy really healed him, he healed him on the Sabbath. So he just broke the law. So we better take him to the experts and see what the experts say about this Jesus guy. So verse 14. Now it was a Sabbath. And of course you know this. The Sabbath is very important to these Jews. And, and the Sabbath was the day that you could do certain things, but you couldn't do most things. You had to refrain from most things because most things were work. And so you couldn't participate in any kind of work. So now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Verse 15, then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put clay, can't you guys hear? He put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Verse 16, therefore some of the Pharisees said, this man, talking about Jesus, is not from God. They're saying there's no way possible that Jesus could be from God. He is not from God. He couldn't be from God. Why? Look at what they say. Because he does not keep the Sabbath. He does not keep the Sabbath. So since Jesus does not keep the Sabbath, he could not possibly be from God. And so others said, how can a man who is a sinner... So, so if you don't keep the Sabbath, then you couldn't possibly be from God. And if you're not from God, then you have to be a sinner. So how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? How could this possibly be? This is impossible. That a sinner could do such things. That someone who's not from God could ever do such a thing. And there was a division among them. That simply means there was confusion. How could it possibly be? How could something like this happen? Verse 17, they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. He said, he's a prophet. Verse 18, 
but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received sight until they called the parents of him who had received sight. So they take this guy to the Pharisees, and, and the Pharisees, they begin to question him, and, and after their questioning, they go, you're a liar. You weren't ever blind. You know, there, there's, there's no way that, that this Jesus could have done what you said that Jesus did because it's the Sabbath and, you know, a man from God wouldn't do something like this on the Sabbath and, and, and so he's just a sinner and a sinner can't do something like this. So you're making this stuff up. You, you are a liar. Let Go get his parents and let's see what his parents have to say. Because clearly, this guy's lying to us. So they go get the parents. Verse 19. And they ask this saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? So, so they bring the parents in and they go, Now, this is your son? And you claim he's always been blind, that, that he's never been able to see, but now he can see? How, how do you say such a thing happened? Verse 20, his parents answered and said, We know that this is our son. You can't fool us. That's him. He's been our son all our life. Of course it's our son. We know our son, and he's been blind since birth. We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. Verse 21. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. They're probably telling a little <coughs> lie. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. That means he's grown up. He's a grown man. So ask him. He will speak for himself. Verse 22. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. They just were afraid they were going to get put out of church. And so they wouldn't admit that Jesus had done this thing. Therefore, verse 23, therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So they bring the parents in, um, the, they ask the parents, is he really your son? Is he blind? They said, well, of course he's our son. Yes, he was blind from birth. And um, how can he see? We don't know. He's a grown man. You ask him. He'll tell you. We don't, we don't have any idea how this happened. Just talk to him. He's grown. Verse 24. So again, they called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. They'll answer to God for that one day. They said, we'll, we'll, If he can see, we're going to give God the glory, but this Jesus guy, he's a sinner. And we're not giving him any credit for it whatsoever. It, it's evident that he can see now. So praise God that he can see, but it's not because of Jesus the sinner. We're not giving him any credit because he healed on the Sabbath, so he couldn't be from God. And, and, and so all of this is impossible, but must be a miracle from God. So praise God that this guy can see but this Jesus guy, no, no, no. Couldn't be, couldn't be. Because he healed on the Sabbath. Now, here we go. Main point of the story. This is what I wanted you to see this morning. It's verse 25. So the blind man, what does he have to say about all this? Verse 25, he answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. He's simply saying, I don't know everything about this Jesus. I don't, I don't know everything. It's 
As a matter of fact, I just met him. Just a little while ago. I don't know everything about Jesus. But look at what he says. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. That's our story. That, that's every one of us. That's our story. It, every one of us, we have a story that's very unique. And, and, and the details are different. And, and where you grew up and how you met Jesus. And, and all of it's different. It's neat. It's unique. It's different. It's a great story. But there's one part of your story that's the same as my story. I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. One thing that I know, because I don't know everything. I, I, I'll admit to you today, every Sunday I preach to you through, through God's Word. But I don't know everything in God's Word. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. There, there, there are things... Every single week as I sit and I listen to TJ, he's teaching me things I didn't know. I'm learning, I'm growing, I don't know everything. But what I do know, I was blind, but now I see. <coughs> I was lost, but today I'm saved. I was on my way to hell, now I'm going in a completely different direction on my way to heaven. Amen. I don't know everything, but I know what Jesus has done for me. I know what he's done in my life. The point is, you have a story to tell. And there's somebody that needs to hear it. I am so grateful, and I'm going to call the man's name out. Um, because he, he made such a difference in my life. His name was Johnny Mac Miller, who told me his story time and time and time again. And because he told me his story, I was once blind, but now I see. We can make an eternal difference in someone's life if we'll simply tell them, this is what Jesus did for me. Would you stand with me? Though I was blind, I now see. You have a story to tell. And my encouragement for you this morning is to tell it. Sometimes, sometimes one of the most difficult things for us to do is to talk to other people about Jesus. One of the easiest things for us to do is to tell other people about us. Well, now that Jesus has come into your life and opened up your eyes and you can see your story about you is the story about Jesus. So share your story. Maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus as your Savior. Today, your eyes can be open and you could say, I was once blind, but now I see. I invite you to come and speak to me for a moment. Maybe you're here and you just struggle with sharing Jesus with others. Just tell your story. It's a great story that someone needs to hear. Maybe, maybe today you just want to get around the altar and ju just make that commitment to share your story. How, however God has spoke to your heart this morning, maybe you want to come pray, you come pray. But just respond to God speaking to you as we sing together.